Hello, my name is Hans Panwert and I am from the Institute of Structural Mechanics of the University of Rostock. I'm pleased to present you my talk about automated crack length measurement for mixed mode fatigue cracks using digital image correlation. I want to start my talk by explaining you the motivation of the present research and showing you the materials and methods used. This is followed by a short introduction into the automated crack detection and measuring a CDM tool by Geri et al. After that, I would like to present you the main new development in this research in the form of an extension of the ACDM tool to measure the crack growth. The calibration of the new method on mode 1 tests is followed by the validation on a mixed mode test. In the end, I will conclude my talk and give some ideas for future work. The present talk is motivated by damage cases with partly catastrophic consequences. In order to prevent those damage cases, fatigue crack propagation needs to be investigated by dealing with the three known crack modes, especially for rotating and safety relevant components in the railway, automotive and wind energy industry. It can be demonstrated that mode 1, 2 and 3 often do not occur separately. In this context, most of the existing mixed mode experiments focus on the combination of mode 1 and 2 or mode 1 and 3 under proportional loading conditions. However, it is not yet possible to describe the crack propagation satisfactory because of the small number of appropriate investigations, especially considering non-proportional loading conditions and furthermore all three crack modes at once. The complexity of the mixed mode loading conditions is visible in these fracture surfaces, which show a lot of features like kinking and twisting of the crack, as well as branching into facets and abraded areas. Therefore, to gain basic knowledge considering the fatigue crack growth under the superposition of mode 1, 2 and 3, systematic experimental examinations are performed. For this purpose, flat SEN specimens made out of a high-strength steel with the given material properties and dimensions are made. Although these were developed for pure bending tests, they guarantee the simultaneous occurrence of all three crack, crack modes along the crack front. A V-shaped starter notch was wire eroded into the specimens to ensure comparable and reproducible conditions. In order to leave the notch influence range, also an initial crack under pure mode 1 conditions was initiated, controlled via the direct current potential drop method. The investigations were performed on a servo hydraulic tension torsion testing machine. Different stress ratios, load ratios, and phase shift angles of the cyclic axial and torsional loading were realized. The evaluation of the complex crack growth was carried out using the digital image correlation. Both sides of the specimens were recorded with one digital camera each. It is well known that the mode 2 in particular leads to kinking of the crack so that the usual methods for automated crack path detection in the case of plain mode 1 cracks cannot be used here. For this reason, in the past we always had to manually evaluate the current crack tip position in the DIC data. To automize and standardize the evaluation of the tests, the ACDM tool developed and provided by Geri et al. is utilized for the crack path detection. The tool works with the DIC data, where the principal strain field is calculated from the image correlation. From the displacement field, the strain, principal strain field is obtained. The principal strain field is then used to determine the crack path. After the crack path detection, crack kinematics, such as crack slip, and crack width are calculated from the displacement field. Here, for example, the crack width is visualized. For the crack path detection, I want to go in some more detail as this approach is quite new as well. Here you can see the principal strain field at different forces during a quasi-static test. For each load step, all the points where a defined strain threshold is exceeded are extracted. The obtained high strain areas are shown here for each load step as this uh, dark gray area. The high strain areas of all the load steps are then combined into a single area where the strain threshold has been exceeded at any time during the test. This is basically a single binary image for the whole test from which the complete crack path is detected. The crack detection itself is performed by skeletonizing this final high strain area into lines consisting of single pixels. From the skeletonized pattern, crack branches 
and nodes are obtained uh, for further processing. As an example, the original ACDM tool provides the crack path here for a mode one test, but without the information of the crack length versus the number of cycles. Therefore, in the following, I want to present you our newly developed extension to the ACDM tool for measuring the crack growth by means of the A versus N curve. The extension starts with assigning the number of cycles to the final crack path. For this, I want to present you two different newly proposed methods. The first one utilizes the crack width provided by the original ACDM tool. Here, the evolution of the crack width is investigated for each point on the crack path. When the crack width exceeds a certain threshold for the first time, this means that the crack tip has arrived at this specific point on the crack. In this example, the crack width threshold of 0.01 mm is exceeded for the first time at 715,000 load cycles for all these points. This is done for every point on the crack path to obtain the number of cycles when the crack tip reaches each specific point on the crack path. The second method uses the principal strain field. During the detection of the high strain areas, the information when exactly the strain threshold is exceeded for the first time is also stored. After the crack path is known, the stored number of cycles is assigned to each point on the crack path uh, which lies in this specific area. This is visualized consecutively here, but actually done within a single calculation step for the high strain area as a whole, which can look like this. As a result, for each point on the crack path, a number of cycles has been measured with both methods. After the evaluation of the load cycle data, the crack length is measured. But as you can see here, a crack can branch under mixed mode fatigue conditions. To address this, firstly, all branches of the crack are aligned with the growth direction using the now known load cycle data. Then the crack initiation point is defined at the tip of the notch. Starting from the initiation point, branches are joined consecutively until an end branch is reached. This results in a single crack for which the A versus N curve can be evaluated. The crack length is obtained by simply summing up all the distances between consecutive points from the initiation point to the end. With an algorithm, all the end branches are found and treated as separated cracks. Therefore, a separate A versus N curve is obtained for each end branch and crack respectively as well. To calibrate the threshold values of both methods, mode 1 tests have been conducted. The first test was a stress intensity factor controlled block load test. The A versus N curve of the resulting crack was measured with the direct current potential drop method as a reference. During the calibration of the crack width method, it becomes visible that two high crack width re thresholds result in an underestimation of the crack length, whereas two low values have the opposite effect. With a crack width threshold of 0.3%, the measured A versus N curve is in good agreement with the potential drop method. However, for large crack length, an increasing overestimation is visible. This is an accumulative effect due to the pixel-based crack path detection. As you can see here, the crack path consists only of 45 degree and horizontal pieces, whereas the true crack path is almost horizontal and straight. With every 45 degree piece, the crack length is slightly overestimated a bit more. To account for this, the crack path can be smooth. This removes the overestimation of the crack length at high crack lengths. Therefore, all crack path in, paths in this investigation are smooth. Furthermore, the same behavior during the calibration as for the crack width threshold can be observed for the principal strain threshold, where 0.4% provides the best results. With these calibrated values, both methods show very similar results, which agree very well with the potential drop method. But it has to be noted that the strain threshold may not only affect the A versus N curve, but also the crack path detection, which will become obvious with the second test. The second mode 1 test was force controlled with a constant Fmax. As you can see, 
the previously calibrated strain threshold of 0.4% leads to an overestimation of the crack length for high crack lengths. For low crack lengths up to 15 mm, the shape of the high strain area is similar to the previous stress intensity factor control test, which results in an accurate A versus N measurement. But with an increase in the crack length, the stress intensity factor also increases due to the force control testing. As a consequence, large areas in front and around of the crack tip may exceed the strain threshold. On the one hand, the large high strain area in front of the crack tip leads to the overestimated crack length. On the other hand, this resulting shape of the high strain area may hinder the crack path detection leading to the false detection of a lot of small branches. To address these issues, the constant strain threshold can be calibrated for the higher stress intensity factor present at the end of the test. This leads to an accurate crack pattern and to an accurate A versus N curve at high crack length. However, the crack length is underestimated for low crack length in this case. As a consequence, a non-constant principal strain threshold is introduced. Both previously mentioned values are used as start and end values. A quadratic interpolation between start and end has been found to provide accurate results for the whole A versus N curve compared to the potential drop method. In con contrast to the principal strain method, the crack width method is sufficient for this test with the previously calibrated constant threshold value. However, the crack width method is more susceptible to outliers. To address this, an option has been included into the extended ACDM tool to detect outliers based on the moving median absolute deviation. By removing these outliers, less noisy results can be obtained. For the validation of the new tool, a test with superimposed in-phase tension torsion loading was conducted. As you can see from the fracture surfaces, the crack kinks and twists as well during the test. As a reference for the validation, single overloads were introduced at every 100,000 load cycles to obtain errors marks on the fracture surfaces. These are clearly visible from the back side of the specimen as well as from the front side of the specimen. The errors marks can be evaluated to obtain the respective A versus N curves with the marker load technique. By using the new crack width method, Good agreement between the new method and the marker load technique can be obtained for both specimen sites. However, the principal strain method provides less noisy data with very good accuracy compared to the marker load technique. In addition to that, the principal strain method reveals even more details, such as the retardation effect after each overload. This clearly shows that the presented extensions of the ACDM tool are valid for the evaluation of mixed mode tests. In addition to the A versus N curve, it is also possible to obtain detailed information about the kinking angle for further investigations. For example, the kinking angle is almost constant for the back side of the specimen and slowly decreases over time on the front side of the specimen. At the end, I want to conclude my talk briefly. An extension of the ACDM tool has been developed for automated crack growth measurements based on the IC data. Two approaches have been presented as well as calibrated on mode 1 tests and validated on a mixed mode test. The new tool provides detailed A versus N and kinking angle data as well as the possibility to evaluate crack branching. Despite the complex processes inside the specimens, the extended ACDM tool is even applicable for out of phase mixed mode loading conditions. However, in the future work, it is planned to improve the test setup for out-of-phase tests. As you can see in the video, under the out-of-phase loading conditions, particles may abrade from the crack flanks and fall out of the cracks. This leads to noisy DIC data, thus hindering the crack path detection. To remove the particles, for example, pressurized air can be utilized. Also, with improved programming and robustness of the crack detection, the effect, effects of noisy DIC data may be reduced. We gratefully acknowledge the financial support provided by the German Research Foundation as well as Geri et al. for providing the MATLAB script. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions.